All right, so let's look at some IGCSE thermal physics. So starting off uh, with defining what pressure is. Pressure is the force per unit area or the force per meter squared, something along those lines. So a closed box contains a gas. Explain in terms of the molecules how the gas exerts a pressure on the walls of the box. Okay, so the first thing is we're getting collisions. So the gas molecules are colliding with the wall of the container. Unless there's a collision happening, there is no force or pressure on the container. Okay, and the next key thing is that during the collision, the momentum of the gas particles changes. Uh, so that might be uh, because its direction has changed most commonly with gas collisions or because it's like velocity changes. Uh, either of those would cause the momentum to change. Okay, and then once we've got that, so we've got momentum change, so force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. That's what Newton's second law tells us. So if the momentum of a gas particle changes, it must have experienced a force. There is no other way for momentum to change. Okay, so Having established that the gas particle has experienced a force, that must mean the container experienced an equal and opposite force. That's what Newton's third law tells us, in fact. And then finally, so that's when so far we've talked about one collision, so with one gas molecule with the container. But these are happening all the time in all different places on the container. So, and it's the accumulation of all of those collisions that lead to a pressure being exerted. Okay. So we've got a flask connected to a pump and also a manometer containing mercury. So that the manometer being the U-shaped tube we can see there. And we can see we've got a height difference on the liquids of the manometer, which indicates there is a difference in pressure either side. Okay, so the right side is at atmospheric pressure and then the other side is going to be at a different pressure. Uh, it's almost going to be a lower pressure because it's higher on that side. Okay, so we've got mercury and we've got a height difference of 250. The density is uh, 13,600. Okay, so calculate the pressure due to the 100, 250 millimeters column of mercury. Okay, so uh, that's what this equation's for. This calculates the pressure at a different depth below the, the surface of a column of liquid. So we know the density, we know the gravitational field strength on Earth is 10, and we've got 250 millimeters converted into meters, and that gives us a pressure of 3.5 times 10 to the 4 pascals. Okay, so that's the pressure due to the column of mercury. So now I want us to calculate the pressure of the air in the flask. So the reason the mercury goes up is to increase the pressure so that the pressure is balanced out. So the pressure from the mercury plus the pressure from the gas in the flask is going to be equal to atmospheric pressure. That's why uh, the liquid has moved to make that happen. So if we subtract the mercury pressure from the atmospheric pressure, that should tell us what the pressure inside the flask is. And that gives us 6.8 times 10 to the 4 pascals. State two ways in which the molecular structure of a gas is different from the molecular structure of a liquid. Uh, well, there's more than two, so let's take a look at them. Uh, so there's much larger separation of molecules in a gas. Uh, the gas particles have much larger potential energy, technically electric potential, but potential usually suffices here. Uh, gas particles travel in straight lines, and then uh, gas particles travel alone. So molecules in a liquid tend to clump together, so even though they're free to move, they are they sort of clump together so compressibility is the ease with which a substance can be compressed state and explain in terms of the forces between the molecules how the compressibility of a gas differs from that of a liquid okay so first of all what is the difference well a gas is much more compressible it is very very difficult to compress a liquid you need a lot of pressure if you're going to do that um, and the reason for that is because the force between gas molecules are far weaker that because their separation is much larger uh, and so that's why gas molecules are more compressible and incidentally more easily expandable also 
<laughs> okay, so the diagram shows a weather balloon being inflated by helium from a cylinder. The helium that inflates the balloon has a volume of 0.035 meters cubed at a pressure of 2.6 times 10 to the 6 pascals. The pressure of the helium in the balloon is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals, and the temperature is the same as it was when it's in the cylinder. Calculate the volume or by the helium in the balloon. So the key statements we saw there was that the temperature is constant, and that allows us to apply Boyle's law. And what Boyle's law says is that at constant temperature, pressure times by volume is a constant, or the pressure times volume initially is equal to the pressure times volume at the end, is another way of phrasing that. So if we want to know the volume at the end, I'm, we're going to um, divide both sides by the initial pressure. Now, I've uh, cancelled out like the times 10 to the 5, so the bottom line should read 1 times 10 to the 5, and the top line 2.6 times 10 to the 6, but I've just cancelled those out already. We need, don't need to fuss with them. And when we do the calculation, we get 0.91 metres cubed. Okay. So as the balloon rises up through the atmosphere, the temperature of the helium decreases. State the effect of this temperature change on the helium molecules. Well, a lower temperature means lower average speed or lower average kinetic energy. Those two things basically say the same thing. Um, so that's the key thing to remember. Temperature and kinetic energy or speed are directly related to each other. Okay, so the diagram shows a liquid in gas thermometer. Okay, so in the process of making a thermometer, the scale divisions were spaced equally. What assumption was made about the liquid? Um, well, we one assumption we've made is that it expands linearly. So if we spaced the divisions equally, we assume that every degree in temperature change, the volume of the liquid increases by the same amount, which is what we describe as a linear change. Okay, so suggest you change the thermometer that would require the spacing of the divisions to be larger. If we made it thinner, or if we decrease its cross-sectional area, that would mean the height change would be much bigger for each degree of temperature change. Um, if we use a liquid with a larger rate of expansion, that would mean we need the larger divisions. And if we had a larger vol bulb at the bottom, that would as well. Because if we have a larger bulb at the bottom, we've got a bigger volume of liquid. And so if overall, say, let's say when we increase the temperature by one degree, its volume increases by one percent, that would actually be a bigger height change on the thing. So uh, that's one I thought of. It's probably the, the first two were probably the ones they were looking for there, but technically you could say a larger bulb of liquid at the bottom too. As a result of the changes, what are the changes needed to enable the thermometer to be used for the same temperature range? So essentially to measure the same maximum minimum values, well, it would need to be longer. So if we made, if we want to increase the sensitivity and keep the range the same for a thermometer, that means making it longer. So the expansion of liquid is an example of a physical property that may be used to measure temperature. State two other physical properties that may also be used to measure temperature. Uh, so one is the resistance of a thermistor. So a thermistor's resistance changes with temperature. It's inversely proportional to temperature, in fact. So that's one property you can use. And the, the other thing that we've come across as part of thermal physics is a potential difference across a thermocouple. Uh, again, we'll look at more what that is as part of the thermal physics course. So let's actually dig into a thermocouple a little bit more. So it asks us to sketch a diagram of one. Um, so before we get to that, there is actually a third way we could measure temperature that I didn't say already. Uh, so we could measure the degree of bending of a bimetallic strip due to the different rates of expansion of two solids stuck together. So that's the third possible way. But going back to the thermocouple, um, this would be the, what we're looking for. So you see a lot of different diagrams of these around. Uh, so I just want to highlight the key things that you would need on there. So you need two different metals because they need two different conductors. And those two need to meet at a point that we call the hot junction. It doesn't actually necessarily need to be hot, but we call it the hot junction. 
Now, those two wires then need to come back and they need to meet another wire at a place we call the cold junction so that they're at the, again, they're at the same temperature at this end, but different to the hot junction. Then you need the same wire, and it's typically copper that's used, connected to a voltmeter. Um, so those are our kind of our key parts. So the two materials labeled on the left, uh, knowing what those are is not particularly important. We just need to know that they're different metals. Okay, so we've got a cross section of a double walled glass vacuum flask. Uh, it's got a hot liquid inside it, and we've got two surfaces which have been silvered, but we can see it's open at the top currently. Okay, so explain why the rate of loss of thermal energy through the walls of the flask by conduction is very low. So Conduction relies on the collision of particles, that can be atoms, molecules, or if they're a good conductor, that's going to be free electrons, and that's what moves energy around or through the material. So if you have a vacuum, uh, a perfect vacuum has no particles. Most vacuums have some, but very relatively few. And because there's few particles, there's very little energy transferred, so the rate of energy transfer is very low. So explain why the rate of loss of thermal energy through the walls of the flask by radiation is low. Well, it told us on the diagram and the instructions that these surfaces were shiny, and shiny is, surfaces are a good reflector and a poor absorber or emitter of infrared radiation. So what's going to happen is the infrared radiation gets reflected back into the container if there's hot stuff in it, or if we decided to put cold stuff in it, it reflects infrared radiation back out of the container. So suggest with reasons what must be added to the flask in order to keep the liquid hot. As I said, there is currently an opening at the top, so we'd want to put a bung or a stopper or you know, a lid on, because uh, that would stop the processes of convection and evaporation uh, leading to energy loss. And if we're going to do that, we might want to put insulation on top of the bung, uh, because we would it's a solid, so that would allow conduction. So we might want an insulator to prevent energy loss by conduction. Okay, so we want to describe an experiment to demonstrate the difference between good and bad emitters of infrared radiation. You may include a diagram to help you with your description. State what readings should be taken. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use two cubes to do this, and I'm going to make, have, make sure they're of the same material, they've got the same surface area, and they've been heated up to the same temperature. So that the only thing that is different about the two cubes is one is going to be shine, have a shiny surface, and the other is going to have a matte black type surface. And then what I do is I would leave them for a period of time, and at the end, the one with the largest decrease in temperature must be the best emitter of infrared radiation because conduction and convection and all those other things would be the same because the, the two cubes are identical. Uh, so that's how we would know which is the better emitter. So on a hot day, sweat forms on the surface of a person's body and the sweat evaporates. Explain in terms of the behavior for molecules the process of evaporation. Uh, so evaporation is the process of high energy molecules escaping from the surface of a liquid. And when that happens, if the high energy particles escape, that means the average energy of all the remaining particles is now lower. And what that means is where if we were to stick a thermometer in, we would measure a lower temperature. Because temperature and average energy are essentially the same thing. And then that cooler liquid is now in contact with the skin. So thermal energy flows from the body to the liquid left on the skin, which is because it's now colder, and then th that acts to equalize their temperatures, but overall the temperature has dropped. So the temperature of a person of mass 60 kilograms falls from 37.2 to 36.7. Calculate the thermal energy lost from the body, and the average specific heat capacity is uh, 4,000. Okay, so let's plug in our numbers. So we're going to be using Q equals MC delta T. We've got a relatively small temperature change, but 
uh, once we multiply that by the mass and the speed of heat capacity, that's going to be quite a lot of energy that we've lost. So the temperature hasn't decreased you know, that much, but that was required us to emit quite a large quantity of energy. Finally, the cooling of the body was entirely due to evaporation of sweat. Calculate the mass of sweat which evaporated the specific latent heat of vaporization is 2.4 times 10 to the 6. Uh, so we're not going to need to make any unit conversions here like we often have to. So using Q equals ml, rearrange it. We calculated the uh, energy in the last one. Uh, so divide by the latent heat of vaporization and that gives us our mass of 0.05 kilograms or 50 grams if you like.